as you're uh, kind of trickling in here, I um, just want to make sure that you're able to use our chat. Um, for folks who joined us last time, we did have some technical <laughs> issues with Zoom. Um, so if, you, if you're able, drop a chat um, and let us know where you're tuning in from um, and what you're most excited to learn about today. And if you're not able to use the chat, I apologize. This was something we struggled with Zoom last time. So um, you can also use the Q&A function um, and that should go through to us. And I will be monitoring that during uh, the conversation. Awesome, so I see we have someone joining us from Ireland. Good to see you, Gabriella. Um, if, you're, if you're coming in now, please let us know um, where, you're, where you're from. And today we are going to be talking about the value of product localization for UX, uh, which is a topic very near and dear to our panelists' hearts. Um, so before we kind of get into the conversation, I uh, just wanted to share some quick notes. So this is being recorded. Um, so feel free to kind of uh, watch it after. Um, you can turn on closed captions in the setting if you would like to see uh, the transcript as the event goes on. If you have questions that um, you'd like us to address, you can ask that in the Q&A feature. And we will share a recap after, um, after this session with the full transcript the video um, and some and some further uh, links and resources. And I'm just looking at the chat really quick. It looks like we have folks in Poland, China, Brazil, Barcelona, Thailand, Germany. Amazing, amazing representation. Argentina. Awesome. Thank you all. I know everyone is you know very busy, and we're we're really great for you to spend some time with us today. And just so everyone can meet our lovely panelists, we have uh, Patricia Gomez Hirado, who is our course author um, at UXCC, as well as the content design lead at King. We have Rosa Vieira de Almeida, a UX content and localization lead. And Gabriel Leck, who is a content designer. Um, so we have folks working in localization and content design um, who can kind of bring uh, a 360 look at this conversation. And I'm Katie, for everyone wondering, um, I work with UX Content Collective um, and I'm currently based in the United States on the East Coast. Awesome. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Patricia um, to kind of kick off the conversation and then we'll get into the, the good stuff, uh, the Q&A. Thank you, Katie. So before we jump into the Q and A, uh, we just got so many questions from the audience. Uh, thank you so much, and I'm I'm so glad that we are having such a global and diverse uh, audience. First of all, so I'm gonna give you like uh, some introductions into the uh, topic, uh, talking about what is translation localization, why product localization matters, why I created this uh, course, and then we can jump into Q and A. You can go to the next slide, uh, Katie. Yeah, so um, you may have heard uh, these really long names that are localization and internet internationalization uh, and these weird um, acronyms. Um, well, you can find like really good or to me like the best descriptions that I could get for these um, really long words. Um, you can find them in the uh, blog from Natalie Kelly. Uh, that is called uh, Born to Global. All these resources are in the in the course, uh, of course. But you know, it's like a good way to kind of like uh, frame the conversation because uh, what is translation? It is a process or adapting the message into other languages for other cultures. Localization is the uh, process or adapting the use of experience, and internationalization is about adapting the code. So it's more like the technical aspect um, of this of it of this. And then globalization, which is a new term that maybe people might not be uh, familiar with. Uh, normally it's uh, the framework that companies and organizations put in place in order to uh, facilitate translation, localization and internationalization. Yeah, so um, we are having this session in English. Uh, and as you know, English is the common language in the business, uh, in the business setup. And also it's more, it's more or less like the lingua franca. However, uh, the world and our users are multilingual. 
um, and also like people in the in the chat, we come from different markets, different countries, and we speak different languages. Uh, for example, I'm I'm based in, in Barcelona, so my native like my mother tongue is uh, Spanish, although I also uh, speak um, English. So looking at some uh, data from uh, the Internet World Stats, the top nine languages um, are Chinese, uh, Spanish, etc. So as you can see, English only accounts for almost 26% uh, of the internet users. So yeah, we, it is a way to kind of like, uh, although we always work in English, we need to work or we need to be mindful that we have a diverse and multilingual audience uh, in front of us. And language definitely matters. Um, according to this uh, study from CCS uh, research that is called uh, Can Read Won't Buy, um, Won't Buy 60% of the respondents prefer content in their language. So although like most of the um, audience, we may think that they uh, speak and understand English, they still wanna see content in the language. 67% of them, they may tolerate mixed languages, English and their mother tongue in a, in a website. 73% uh, want product reviews in the language. 66% use, uh, use only online machine translation. Um, so even if the quality is not great, at least they prefer to um, also read in their, um, in their own language. And most importantly, 40% of the respondents will not buy in other languages than their mother tongue. So that's really, really important because uh, although people might be comfortable um, using English or online, they might not buy products if the content is offered to them in English. So they really... Uh, they have a preference for um, accessing and using products in their um, own language. So language definitely matters. And yeah, the reason why um, I created this course is because like um, both content designers and uh, localization specialists, they work like really um, closely together uh, because uh, in the end, like our, um, we both work with words. And, you know, I've been getting in through my whole career, I've been getting lots of questions from uh, content designers on how to work with localization folks, how to raise the profile of localization in their, in their companies. So I wanted to provide uh, some um, help to, to content designers to understand what the discipline is about and how, how they can help their companies understand localization a bit more and how they collaborate better uh, with localization colleagues in order to enable like a more um, uh, global uh, user experience and also like adapt the experience into different uh, requirements and expectations from our multilingual, multicultural audience. This is the content of the, of the course. Uh, it has uh, six units. Uh, each unit has uh, some uh, lessons. So at the end of each lesson, uh, you can find a quiz uh, so you can find uh, some uh, questions to set uh, the knowledge and understanding of the content. And also at the end, there's a practice uh, project that every student has to complete. And then our um, course instructor um, is uh, helping students and providing feedback about the, about the project. So yeah, the content is uh, very hands-on, uh, has lots of um, links to resources that you can use in your, in your companies to kind of like help your stakeholders uh, understand localization a bit more. Um, and yeah, get like a better um, understanding on how to work uh, within the localization space. So two highlights that I, that I like to mention. The first one is that in the course you will find about like one of my kind of like recommendations or um, you know ideas that I have that will be um, that is like bringing UX writing or content design and localization closer into like a like a team or a group that will be um, global content. So this is you can read more about uh, about this in the in the course. But this is one of like um, this is uh, the ideal that I'm always uh, aiming for, and that's why um, I love like bridging gaps between and kind of like increasing the collaboration um, between localization and uh, and content design. And lastly, um, yeah, design stage uh, localization. This is like a new way of uh, adapting the content into um, other languages. We are moving away from uh, looking at localization as an afterthought to actually including uh, localization as part of the design process. So yeah, let's start with the Q&A.
I was muted. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Patricia, for kind of taking us through that overview. Um, and for folks interested in learning more, we'll obviously share some links and recaps after. Um, but we received, I mean, I think like 50 or 60 incredible questions. And so obviously we won't get to all of them today, um, but we hope to kind of cover some of the main themes and topics that we saw. Um, and if we don't cover your question, we'll have kind of a recap blog um, where we can hopefully go more in depth. Um, so with that, yeah, let's let's get into it. So the first question here is, at what stage of the product development process should localization be involved? Um, and I would love to kind of hear from Rosa. Rosa, if you wanna give us some thoughts here, um, that would be awesome. Sure. First off, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here with everyone. Um, I think in, in this one, I would say I would sort of follow on from what Patricia was saying, um, the, the last two points that she sort of uh, highlighted from the course, right? This idea of global content setup and of design stage localization, particularly the latter design stage localization. I think ideally localization, if at all possible, should be uh, coming in at the design stage, if not fully, then at least partially in one way or another. And I think the main reason for this is that um, just like good content design, good localization really requires a thorough understanding of things like a thorough understanding of the user. It requires a really strong grasp of constraints. The earlier you have those, the better, as we all know as, as content designers. It's, it's no fun to receive constraints as surprises later on uh, down the road. Um, and it also involves, um, it also really requires good rounds, uh, like a few good rounds of iteration and testing. The more testing you can do um, in some kind of testing environment before things go live, the better that's going to be. So I think the more tools translators have, but also the more time that translators have to do translation and to use the tools that are given to them, the better the outcome. Um, and I think the results for that sort of speak for themselves. And I think they're there. And when we talk about design stage localization, I think it's one of the interesting things there is it can mean many different things to, to, to different people. Right. But, but I think one of the ways, um, one of the ways we can think about it is we can sort of pick and choose what we want and what we are able to, because not everyone works at these super large organizations with huge budgets and amazing resources and all of that. But if we can pick and choose, one thing that we can do, for example, is uh, research. We can do research uh, with translators, uh, which will lead to obviously more research in more languages, which is good because we're not limited to the languages that the content design team speaks necessarily. Um, we can have better research insights because people are generally more comfortable uh, speaking in uh, in their mother tongue or a language that they're just more comfortable in rather than English being forced to speak English when maybe they're not as comfortable in that. A key thing here also is that doing research in um, in localized languages, it really makes localization visible. And I think that's something that we may return to later on uh, down the line is localization really needs to be made visible in order to make an impact in an organization. And then it really helps uh, increase translator knowledge. So one of the things that I'm really keen on is this idea that Patricia also talked about, which is sort of decentering the English experience and sort of making space for more language experiences. So the more uh, translators have knowledge, the more they are able to, the more they have knowledge about the business and the user, the more they're actually able to contribute to commenting on things like the English copy. So it really, I think, um, helps form the space for local, like the, the earlier it comes in, it really helps form the space for good localization to happen and good content design, because I think, uh, like Patricia, I, I think these things do go hand in hand. Wow. That was a great answer. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for kind of sharing that um, that perspective. And then Gabriel, as a content designer, I, I want to hear from you and kind of your thoughts on um, the involvement in the in the process. I definitely agree with Rosa about localization being involved in the design stage, especially during the research stage. I mean, as a content designer, I also feel that it's critical for localization to be included at that particular stage. So maybe I'll just give some examples of that. Like at Grab, like we do a lot of research on ride hailing. And so when I when I was doing a recent project on ride cancellations, and the goal for that project was to kind of use a confirmation nudge on the app to dissuade people from canceling their rides. 
the team wanted to do a number of A-B tests in this case. And one of the hypotheses was whether we should highlight the, the potential savings or potential expense of canceling the write in the message nudge to get viewer cancellations. So I mean, in an experiment like this, it is really critical to make sure that localization is aware of the, of the hypothesis itself and the nuances of the experiment at, at each stage of the discussion. Like I made a mistake earlier of like just looping in localization at the end and telling them to translate like the variant, the variant, the variant strings. And then when that happened, I mean like the localization team might not really understand what the point of the experiment is and how critical it is to get the nuances right in both variants. And they might also unintentionally add new variables into the strings themselves. And so this can result in like, in like the test being inconclusive. But also more than, besides just like getting the right content for testing, right? Localization is also key in certain places where we need to get the local context as Rosa shared also. Like for example, in another like AB experiment where we did at Grab, we wanted to find out whether time or distance info is more important in like cancellation messages. So for example, should we should the message say something like, if you're going to cancel the right, like should, should it say like your driver is coming in five minutes? Like, are you sure you want to cancel? Or should it be like your driver is 2 km away? Are you sure you want to cancel? So we thought this was just a straightforward experiment until we met one of the ID language specialists who told us that this might not be appropriate because traffic conditions in Jakarta, in Jakarta and Indonesia it's kind of different. Like the driver could just be 2km away, but then that could translate to like 25 or 30 minutes of like waiting time. So obviously we cannot show the time variant in that case. And then so, um, similarly, we also did like another kind of A-B test on empathy where we wanted to see whether we wanted to include like driver names in, in these cancellation messages. So for example, you would say like, um, your driver is nearby. Are you sure you want to cancel? Or should we say like Carlos is nearby? Are you sure you want to cancel? These kinds of things, I mean, it, it's really easy to do, right? But the thing is that you must take note that in English, because we use the first name, I mean, it, it is very easy to put these things in the content and make it fit in the string. But if you're talking about like the names of other languages, like Thai names, I mean, like we will have probably have to end up truncating a lot of these things. And then the end result of this is that we end up with a message that's more mechanical, which is not what we wanted to test for in the first place. I also, also want to add on that it's not just like quantitative research where, where it's good to bring in localization in. I mean, like even for discovery research, there's also a lot of like cases where localization really like help to help help, help us to, to make sure that we are testing the right things. Like at Grab, there was a project in which we wanted to come up with a new like flow so that people can create business accounts to book like corporate rights and tag them as corporate so they can get easy reimbursement later on. And we wanted to make sure that these people use their business emails uh, to sign up. But before we even tested, we realized that in Vietnam, this was coming from one of the, what, some, of the some of the people from the localization team as well, is that a lot of people actually use Gmail for the business email. And so it, because of that, I mean, like fundamentally, the, the logic of the product just wouldn't work. And then we could just save the time and resources to do something else rather than spend all that money doing research on an idea that isn't going to work. Wow. Gabriel, that was, I mean, that was very, very practical use cases. And I think it just shows that localization is so much more than just changing the CTA button or translating the string, right? It's thinking about the, the local context, the nuances, um, and, and actually understanding what um, users in that geographic um, region want and need. So that those are really great use cases. Thank you so much for, for sharing those with us. Um, Patricia, I'm just wondering if there's anything that you kind of want to add on to that or should we, that was a, that was a, those are some great answers. So we can move on if you'd like. Yeah, this one example that I wanted to mention that proves how involving localization uh, earlier actually works. I'm um, doing my time at uh, working in, a, in an online travel agency. We, for the first time, we launched a product in a non-English market first. So we had to launch uh, eDreams Prime into France uh, first, and then we were uh, we rolled out the product into the different markets. So this was um, like a reason why we started doing research directly in uh, in French with the French uh, users for the French market, and this, this that was like a really good opportunity for the French content content specialist to actually move away from a localization specific role to actually be like a real um. French UX writer and bring 
specific insights about the expectations from the from the French uh, users that might be completely different from the expectations from the UK users because normally we were doing research in English only and then translating the content into um, other languages. So the the fact that we had to launch a product in France uh, first, for example, was kind of like the um, the reason for us to do research in the uh, target language. And that brought a lot of insights that were that then the product team were able to use to make uh, the product less su uh, like really um, adapted to the expectations of the of the French uh, users. Wow, that's yeah, awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. Great. Well, that's just the first question. Let's let's keep going. <laughs> um, so this one's a bit more tactical. Uh, so talking about the best plugins to localize content in Figma or kind of any other add-ons or tools that you're using within the design process um, to kind of help localize content. Um, I'm wondering, yeah, if anyone would, would like to start with this one. I can take this one. Um, we're seeing that uh, more and more design tools like Figma or uh, Sketch are um, creating plugins to connect with uh, translation and localization tools. Um, in the course, you can find like a, like a metrics or a map of all the translation management systems that you can find in the market. And most of them, they already have a plugin that connects with uh, Figma. So for example, um, using the, the localized plugin, you can, from Figma, um, push the, the strings in, in localized, um, and then the, the translation team will do the translations in, in localized. And then from there, you can, pull back translations into Figma and see how the design will look like in other in other languages. Actually, the, these plugins are kind of like the, they are enabling uh, like this collaboration with localization and they're making it possible that localization can um, get into the design process earlier. And also they can get a lot more context because um, believe it or not, uh, sometimes translators don't even get a screenshot of the string that they are translating. Oh, yeah. And we'll, um, for folks interested in different kinds of plugins and tools, um, we can share some resources after as well. Um, and like Patricia mentioned, um, there are uh, resources in the course. Rosa, I see a raised hand. I love that. <laughs> I thought I should just use the feature. Uh, yeah, I was just yeah. going to jump in on 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 uh, what Patricia was saying. Um, so yeah, definitely. I think one of the really interesting, so we also use Localize uh, at my org. Um, and I, I think one of the really cool things there is that we can actually have translators in Figma. So going back to the previous question is like, how do you start collaboration? Um, I think uh, you start it right at the beginning and you start with giving localizers Figma access, if at all possible. I know many of us in content design are still fighting for us to have Figma access, let alone localizers. But I think having localizers see their copy in context and be able to play around with copy and like be able to play around with length and dynamic text and you know all of that i think that's that's going to be really crucial the other really nice thing about um maybe not localized necessarily but but one of these tmss that you could push and pull content uh, from is that we personally use it as a source of truth for copy um which is actually really useful because you know you could just download like uh, your your entire spreadsheet of copy across your app. And it creates, uh, and you can create sort of an archive of the copy and like have a little bit of documentation there as well. So that's one, one way that we use it, I think that I find uh, pretty useful. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, we'll keep moving along so we can get some more questions. Um, so localization specialists are often not recognized as UX writers. What can they do? to communicate their essential role. Patricia? Yeah, I think I mentioned earlier this example from uh, Adrian Prime, which was like a really good example on how a localization specialist can provide value uh, for a given uh, market. So one thing uh, that I like to mention as well is that how important it is to have um, in-house localization specialists for key markets. Um, depending on the size of the company um, and the budget of the company, um, many companies, um, they have internal UX writers who uh, design and write a copy in English. And then we, um, like they send um, or get translations from a third party provider that work with uh, external um, or freelance translators. 
Uh, but I would like to, you know, have a have a think about how great it would be to have internal language specialists that can advocate for some uh, key markets. Uh, like in the in in my previous job, I had um, in my team, I had one localization specialist per market, um, just considering the top uh, five and six um, markets for the for the company. And the way they can uh, communicate their essential role is like they can help um, research understand why it matters doing research in other uh, languages uh, beyond uh, English. They can help um, developers understand why you need to format case in a, in a given way uh, because you know developers may not speak other languages so they might not be they might not be aware that for example for doing plural that plurals work differently uh, in languages like uh, Polish or, or Russian. That's why having diverse team is uh, is key. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's a comma in the chat. Um, so someone said, I don't fully agree with the idea um, that localizations need to cover UX writing tasks. These are not exactly the same areas. I think, so the way this question is framed, I think it should say localizations are not often recognized like UX writers, meaning they aren't given the same kind of, um, I don't know, they aren't, they aren't okay. seen as, yes. So we're not, sorry, this, the way this question is worded, they're not, um, we're not saying that localization folks need to be UX writers, but they're not given the same appreciation as UX writers. Um, so and at the same time, uh, UX writing might be like a, like a career path for localization specialists uh, at some at some point. Yes, yes, of course. Awesome. Great. So um, we had a couple of questions in the chat about this and and several people asked. So, we all know it's important. How do we actually convince stakeholders to prioritize um, making these improvements to the localization process? And um, Gabriel, I think that you you had a couple um, examples you wanted to share. Yeah, well, this ties into some of the work I'm doing with localization at Grab. I think that if we want to start with any kind of like localization uh, change, even start with breaking any kind of like localization process changes, it's good to start small, like experiment with smaller teams and then work with different stakeholders, like your content designers, different localization people, even like content ops, and maybe even your product designers. So I mean, like some of the ways to do it, I mean, the first and foremost would be to just like try it out. So recently, one of the recent things I've been doing at Grab is to actually introduce the pluralization feature on our TMS, which is what like Patricia shared as well, to our content processes. So this pluralization feature, for example, if you have a string on your app that says like um, your GIF has been sent and then you need another variant that says your GIFs have been sent, you can actually like store these two variants on the same key. And then for all the other languages, um, the TMS will actually just figure it out based on the number of plural forms each language has, so you don't have to worry about that. So when I was trying to propose this, I mean, in the back of my mind, I have a workaround in place in case engineering was not able to handle these like plural, plural keys. And this is actually kind of like a new process at Grab, because at Grab, we mainly do with Southeast Asian languages. And in Southeast Asian languages, usually for most, most of these Southeast Asian languages only have one plural form, and that's called the other form. So one of the things that I, that, that I wanted to do in order to get buy-in for this um, feature was to first like to get a sense check of whether we can even use this. So I tested this in a small team. Like I wanted to find out how would the language the language specialist for the Southeast Asian languages actually fill up the plural forms of the strings on the TMS. And at Grab, we are using like phrase. Then like um, would they know what to do when they when they see like you know two E and variants and then would they would they wonder like which one are they supposed to localize and things like that? And I also wanted to see how engineers work with such keys. If if let's say we give out like the JSON files for them and then they see like there are like two variants, like would they be able to handle it in the code? Like would they be they, is the system actually configured in a way that would that would allow that? So I, I mean that for the experiment, I mean like at Grab, I mean like it, this actually worked for Android but not on iOS because of the string file requirements. And then one of the things that I had to do was just to ask like the engineering managers for advice on how to socialize this. So it's more about like, you know, just about like finding out how much effort these things will take, but at the same time, like, like, like don't like go around sounding like this is a decision from one person or from one team. And then the other things that you can also do to kind of get more buy-in for such experiments would be also to kind of like make sure that you communicate that whatever you're trying 
um, tell, uh, find a way to isolate the impact. So for example, in a, a separate like experiment with regard to localization processes, we wanted to actually introduce this feature called the review workflow on the translation management system, which is basically just a, a way, a simple way to mark whatever keys you have on the system with status labels like verified or reviewed so that, um, so that people will know whether the translation that you see on those keys are actually finalized by the, localize, the localization team or not. And then this will also benefit us if let's say we if we proceed to use like large language models in the future, right? I mean, like, and we use these LLMs to pre-translate content, we will be able to identify these pre-translated keys with status labels. So to make sure that a human actually goes in to verify these uh, machine translated translations. So, I mean, one of the things that we wanted to see from this experiment was to, was to find out whether this is effective or not, because it also adds steps for the localized localization team. So testing it in a, in a contained environment would be a good way to socialize this impact if it works later on. And then, of course, another thing about this is also the fact that you need to raise awareness about the different kinds of like processes that you have in mind, because a lot of the time it's like, um, at a large organization like Grab, is I always assume that if it's not in place, that means that someone else has already tried it and it didn't work, but that's actually not the case. Like for example, it's like when I wanted to set up this like automation feature on our TMS to actually like duplicate all our English like ENUK strings into the ENUS language, and then find a way for the TMS to actually change the spelling from and formatting of these strings so, such that it is in, in keeping with the ENUS strings. A lot of people didn't actually know that there was actually such a way to do this. And then um, it is it is only like from the from 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 the start where we where we, where we formed like where, where we formed like small groups to explore how these various features work. Only then can we actually socialize this to more to, to other to other people. Gabriel, that thank you so much for sharing all these use cases and case studies. I'm sorry, my dog just entered the room, so hopefully he doesn't bark. Um, no, I think what you what you said about starting small, right, and scaling impact or being able to isolate impact is very important. Um, and thank you for sharing that. Are there any other? Um, oh, Rosa, I love the hand feature. Yes, <laughs> how to use it. Um, I, I, I want to echo just like one thing of what Gabriel was saying, which is I think starting small is really crucial. And um, the reason for that is like everything Gabriel said, but also I think also also just sort of sanity, um, because so coming from a startup to scale up environment, uh, we were only dealing with seven languages. So so my idea was like, OK, we're just going to improve localization across these seven languages. We we, we did it sort of the, the right way, which was like we created a priority matrix. There were a few languages that were deemed to be priority languages. This was like bus business impact related um, and user numbers related. Um, but had we not done that and had we tackled them all, I think it would have been very difficult to sort of perfect the craft and the operational side of localization while also at the same time evangelizing and doing all the socialization that Gabriel was talking about as well. So I think it, it and, and for me, if I had to go back, uh, we started with two and then quickly um, increased to three. But if I had to go back, I would have just done the one language and I would have just chosen our most, uh, like our main localization language and perfected that because I think we ultimately ended up having a few problems sort of like in terms of stakeholder management and stuff that I, I don't think we were doing very well precisely because we were too focused on the craft and the operational side of things and not as much on the management of stakeholders so so that's definitely something that i learned through our our own process with localization great yeah patricia yeah, continue with the stakeholder management uh, topic that Rosa mentioned. Um, I think it, it's also a good idea to tie localization efforts with the company KPIs on the and the um goals. Because if you are able to, for example, link uh, the improvements in localization with, for example, time to market, uh, you know, then you have like an improvement that the business uh, can understand and can relate to their uh, to their needs. As usual, like understand your audience when it, and, and in terms of like stakeholders, understand what they need, what they care about and try to link your um, your value, your goals, your KPIs to the needs of the of the business and your uh, stakeholders so that they see you as a value added uh, partner. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. All right, let's keep going. Um, 
So this is a good question. How can we maintain, maintain brand voice and tone in the translation process? I'm wondering, Patricia, if you have any thoughts here? The like um, easiest way is to keep style guides in several languages. Um, I know that um, many content designers create like tone of voice guidelines for um, normally English or the language that they manage, but it would be great to actually roll out these um, guidelines into other languages to, to make sure that the um, run guidelines and tone of voice guidelines are also kind of like defined and mapped for other languages um, as well uh, to, to be like a guidance for, for translators. Another um, good resource is creating glossaries uh, to map like key terminology or key feature names or product names uh, that translators uh, need to follow and keep consistent with it the, within their, their translations. And in general, I would say that um, make sure that content designers provide as much context as possible to guide uh, translators and also to give them um, context about um, you know, how to interpret several like certain messages uh, into their, their market. So I would say this um, three context always, style guides and glossaries. Great, awesome. So kind of getting back to the idea of KPIs, which we just talked about and connecting to business goals, um, are there specific localization KPIs that folks should be building and measuring against to kind of prove the value and the impact um, of their localization work. And I think Patricia, you also might have some thoughts here. Yeah, normally um, there's two different kinds of KPIs that we can have around localization. The first one could be like the internal uh, KPIs and then the external KPIs that you hold your external uh, provider accountable uh, with. For example, um, on-time delivery is like a really important KPI just to make sure that translations are getting on time uh, for the release or for yeah the, the feature. And then regarding the quality space, um, it's really important to have KPIs to measure how many translation errors um, happen in every translation project and also the severity. So translation errors can be um, spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, um, mistranslations, and even readability that, you know, that translation is correct, but still doesn't sound natural to the uh, to the target uh, reader or to the local um, user. Um, and there's a third uh, category that you can put in place that is about communication and service delivery. That's a really important um, way to kind of like keep your translations provider accountable for, uh, you know, like how they work, how they manage projects, uh, how they communicate with us, then uh, internal stakeholders, uh, et cetera. Great. I thought this was a great question um, because I, uh, as content designers, UX writers, localizers, um, I think we're we're very familiar with following the rules. Um, and and so, is it okay to break the rules in order to speak to write more naturally in some of these certain geographies? Um, I would love to hear from from anyone who has some hot takes <laughs> on this one. Yeah, I can I can start first then. Uh, I mean for, for, for me, I, I lean towards like not like not breaking the grammar rules, but I guess it ultimately depends on what you want. Because I, I mean for me, I like at grab, I mean like clarity is still important. So I mean it's important to follow like global standards in terms of like grammar and, and like universal style guides. But the more important thing is also about what your product is going to be used for and who is going to be used for. So for example, like for an app like Grab, right? I mean, like we have travelers, uh, we have travelers who are coming in to Southeast Asia and then they're trying to book like rides. And some of the top concerns they have, like especially for like for for travelers from China, they like safety is a major consideration from them when choosing a ride hailing service. And so it's like we want to make sure that when they see the Grab app, we need to really make sure that, that, it's, that it's professional and we cannot have anything that makes them doubt whether this is a legit like service or not. Because I mean, like, um, like, like research studies have shown have shown that some of the, the concerns from travelers coming to Southeast Asia is that they think that they will get kidnapped. But then, I, but then it's like, to me, it's like, I just, I'm just wondering where this come from. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so safety, safety and professionalism. Um, definitely understand that. 
Do we have any other thoughts around kind of breaking the rules to to read or or speak more organically? I will go back to our users, um, you know, because this is the, this is the difference between kind of like the grammar rules that academia uh, provides, and then it's how people speak. For example, in in Spanish, it's like a good example that we have the um, the the RAI, which is the academia that kind of like marks or creates all the rules for Spanish. But then we have our users that are spread among many countries around the world. And sometimes, uh, you know, like the academia takes some time to actually capture the real uh, usage. And since we want to provide products to our real users, I think sometimes, uh, in my opinion, it's better to use a language that represent and uh, where the users feel uh, represented rather than maybe like the strict grammar rules. So without making any errors or, or mistakes that will um, damage like uh, understability, um, I think it is okay, you know, to create a language that resonates with like real, real users. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna, Katie, can I still jump in on this one? Please. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with with both of you. I, I think I think it really, uh, of course, depends on the product. It depends on the language. It depends on the user and the tone even of the product. Um, but I think one anecdote I have from my work is that we we started experimenting since we started doing design stage localization. We started experimenting a lot with code switching and bilingualism. So we'll have things that are maybe a little bit more difficult to understand. We'll sort of put it in the, we have it in the localized language, and then we have it in the language of the locale where it is used. So for example, we'll have something that is a flow in Somali language, but it is set for users who are connecting to us from Sweden, for example. So then we'll have terms translated. We'll, we'll just go back and forth between the languages in certain terminology. Like this has to do with bureaucratic things like numbers and certain uh, certain types of documents. So that's one thing um, where we mix. Another example that we've actually never, we never actually did anything with, but in terms of research, it came back to us a few times when we were um, speaking to users about our use of German. Uh, so our user base that uses German in the app is mostly, uh, sp mostly speakers of German who are of a Turkish migration background. So these are first and second generation immigrants um, with some kind of migration background from Turkey. And very often we got the response that our German was actually too German. It was too correct. And it was not the way that speak people spoke. And this, of course, presented this a bit of a dilemma for us because we all we, we have other people who read us in German who are not necessarily from a Turkish background. Right. So then but but then that, I think, was actually quite rich for us to realize, like, oh, this the sense that we have of like, oh, is it in perfect German? That's that's maybe not the question. The question, and and this goes back to I think the larger issue of content design, right? It's it's not so much about wordsmithing and like getting the precise, at least not for me, like not getting the precise um, word down, but it's actually like, does this entire experience make sense? Like it can be the most beautiful sentence, but if the experience doesn't make sense, if the component doesn't necessarily need to be where it is, then maybe. Um, maybe that the actual sort of word choice is a little bit less uh, is a little bit less important. And and I think one of the things that I think about a lot about is like, how can we be less precious with language? And if yeah. we are less precious with language, will that will that sort of distance from language allow us to ask sort of better questions like macro strategic questions about is this actually serving a user need, right? And I think um, just to plug here for, um, there was this recent uh, content strategy insights uh, interview that Larry Swanson did with K uh, Casey Gar Garza, I think her name is, at Hotjar. Mm -hmm. And she basically talks about this. And, and it's, a really, it's a really interesting interview, if anyone's curious, where she says, like, it's, it's really about the meaning. It's not necessarily about the precise word. So I definitely fall on the side of like breaking grammar rules where necessary. Yeah, so I have... am um I'm looking that up right now as we speak. So I will when I find that I'll drop that in the chat. And I think that comes back to an interesting um concept around uh yeah, like language policing, grammar policing, and and kind of um the elitism elitism that might come from that, right? So like being able to kind of allow folks to communicate and express themselves and and not feel like they'll be criticized or critiqued or, you know they have to follow these specific rules. And so, um, yeah, I think what you said about 
not being so precious about language is 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 on point. Um, okay, awesome. Let's move on to the next question. Um, so how do you manage gender inclusive language while also designing for different geographies? Um, I know this is this is definitely a big question. Um, and I think we'll start we'll start with Patricia here um, and would love to kind of hear from you. And maybe you can talk a little bit more about the gender inclusive language project that we also worked on. Yeah, sure. Um, well, actually, um, this is an area where localization can play a really key role uh, because they are the ones in actually providing guidelines on how to make um, language or messages or communication in other languages in a more uh, gender inclusive um, way. Um, and yeah, now you mentioned uh, the UX Content Collective recently launched a project uh, about gender inclusive uh, language. Um, maybe we can add the link in the in the chat yep. uh, because we had we recorded videos for up to like ten languages, giving like um, um, practical advice and giving like resources and tips and tricks on how to do um, how to write being more. Uh, inclusive from a gender perspective uh, for, for different uh, languages. So it's like a really uh, important resource so that you don't have to start from scratch in your uh, companies. You can use that information uh, already uh, available in the website. It was like a really, really interesting uh, project to work with different content designers from different uh, countries, uh, backgrounds and, uh, and languages. Um, and also like in my case, I was working with a content designer from, from Chile we focused on uh, capturing Spanish from Spain and Chile, because as you may know, like uh, Spanish is like a super diverse uh, language. Uh, so we make it, made it specific to our, our markets, but we plan to add more and more um, countries and, uh, and languages as well. Great. Gabriel, um, do you have any examples you wanna share from your experience? Yeah, I guess um, for some of the Southeast, Asian languages. I mean, I actually checked check some of this with, with the localization team at, at, at Grab. So I mean, like for, for for example, like in Chinese, I mean we have the pronoun that that's that says like that we have the pronoun, we have the pronoun like which reads like ta in Chinese. And then there are actually there are actually like two forms for that in Chinese. I mean, like one is one one is like the traditional, like the masculine and then form, and then the other one is the, is the feminine form. But the thing is that in Chinese, usually we tough out the masculine version of that pronoun if we're referring to either or or, or like or like or like or like or like both possibilities. So what we do at Grab would be to write, for example, if a sentence says like um we are sending a gift to this person in Chinese, it will be something like um song li ping ge ta. So instead of using ta, we will actually just use the more gender neutral option called ta ren, like ta, but ta will still be in the masculine form. So it's not ideal, but the problem is that Chinese is not really uh because chinese is like the chinese characters are not that easy to to change like certain endings like we can do with italian languages where we can invent like a new like um like a new like like suffix to support like gender neutral forms but in chinese this is more complicated then i mean for other languages like thai right i mean in thai it's usually considered polite if let's say you end the sentence with the word like like crop or car uh, but then the choice of word will actually depend on your gender. So we use crap if you're a male speaker and car if you're a female speaker. So I grab because we don't have uh we 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 in order to, to be gender neutral in this, we have to avoid using these forms and then we have to find other ways to sound polite. Like this is in contrast to other kind of like other companies who can solve this problem if let's say they have they have they have like a gendered persona for their brand voice so in that case they can just choose like crop, crop or car and then for some of the other languages like burmese or chinese i mean like burmese or vietnamese um the localization team actually tries to use like different kinds of of words or pronouns um to solve this issue so for example instead of saying like them or him or her they will just say like if you are talking about a context of like for like um if we're talking about getting like rights with rights with others, they would just say like getting right. Uh, are you going? Are you trying to get a right with your with your friends? Or if the context is about ordering food, they will say like, would you like to order for your for for your for for your for your food needs instead of instead of saying like, would you like to order food for him or her? Yeah. Yep. Great. Awesome. Um, any other thoughts on this question? 
so we'll kind of keep moving along. Um, and like uh, Patricia said, I dropped the link to the Gender Inclusive Language Project in the chat as well. So you can kind of see how um, folks in other languages are addressing um, more inclusive language in their products. Great. So I think we're getting we're getting close to our last questions here. Um, so this is this is a big one. Um, how do you close the gap and collaborate across localization and content design teams? Um, Patricia? And this is a million dollars question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's not like a single recipe that works for um, everyone because, uh, you know, like some companies can have like the global content team set up, uh, but some other companies are, you know, depending on the structure, they're not able to kind of like bring these two teams together. However, collaboration is key and breaking down silos is also key. So um, I normally encourage UX writers to provide as much context about their um, microcopy as possible, not only through screenshots, but also explaining the intent of the message, explaining why, uh, you know, what is what is the intention? Uh, what is the, the flow uh, about? What is it that we um, want uh, users to do in a given uh, feature? Um, and also they can be like great um, at influencing design and also uh, development on how to create experiences that are more adapted uh, to requirements from other markets. So we can play a key role in kind of like advocating for um, users in other in other markets beyond um, you know English speaking markets and um, like as um, Rosa was saying, decentering uh, English we can be like a play a key role in 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 there. And also on the other side, localization, they can help content design by providing um, international input on what are the expectations from a given market or what are the requirements that a given language uh, need in terms of like um, formatting the strings or formatting the information architecture in a given um, in a given string. They can also provide content about how to write copy that uh, can be like localized more easily um, and also um, like giving input on how certain like jokes or um, cultural references can be interpreted in other markets so that there's this conversation around how uh, you know we want to deal with um, cultural um, references in different uh, markets for our product and as well they can uh, help with uh, internationalization like advising on how we need to prepare the code because before we even start thinking about uh, translations. And they can also help with uh, culturalization, providing cultural input, uh, for example, on how, um, you know, maybe a character in a video game can be uh, perceived in different uh, markets and cultures. Great, great. Um, Rosa, I think you might have an, an, a story to share. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm not so much, not so sure if it's a story, but but I, I think just following on from what Patricia was saying, um, I mean, there's a lot to say, but but I think essentially it would be creating moments of uh, of shared work, creating moments of collaboration, whether that's through a crit, uh, like a synchronous crit, whether that's asynchronously through uh, a shared Figma file, but actually discussing um, actually discussing what's going on in terms of the design and where the why the design decision was made in, in such a way. I think that's extremely useful. Um, I think that the earlier one can get localiza uh, localization in the design process, that's even more important because then you're actually allowing localizer translators to come in at the point right before design decisions are being made, right? So then you can actually take into account what people have to say um, and you can actually sort of avoid uh, all kinds of problems. Um, I think going back to something that we we discussed earlier, I think visibility is going to be really key. Um, and one of the things that especially UX content designers who who may um, who hopefully are on a design team and hopefully are a little bit a little bit listened to by this point in in many organizations, um, I think it's really incumbent, incumbent upon them and us to actually make localization more visible. And so that means like talking about localization in demos or raising localization or, you know, when you talk about timelines, like always add 
time for localization and mention it. Um, and I think that's um, that's one way that we can sort of create the space and the time for the collaboration because we're all super overworked um, defending our jobs and other people's jobs and just doing the actual craft of, of the job, right? So I think if we don't show uh, the work and if we don't make it more visible, then I think it's really hard to create these moments. So visibility is something that I find really key here. Yeah, I'm just a bit rosa about the visibility, but I feel that this can also be done in like two main ways. I mean, the first part would be, would be like knowledge sharing and, uh, and 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 sharing context, like letting see letting content designers know about the localization process challenges. Like for example, if the content designers are working on an on an emoji guide, it would be good for the localization team to also be involved so that they because they have a more contextual idea of what emojis are accepted or not. Like for example, in Indonesia. It's like we cannot show like the piggy bank or the beer emoji and then things like this, um, which are important for content designers to know it as well. I mean, questions like how to format currencies, like it can, it's like a lot of people might not understand that even though there are some universal ways to display currency, there are still some differences when it comes to certain languages. Like in Indonesian, even if you're using like currency codes, right? Like in English, we'll write, we'll write it as like USD 5000, but for the Indonesian language, currency codes has to go behind the value, which is different from, from many other languages. And then also for, even when it comes to things like, like if you want to show like times of day, if you want to show, use the 12 hour system, like is it really practical? Because in certain countries like Vietnam, they have like four different words to refer the times of day, and it cannot just be collapsed into two groups like AM and PM. So this adds new challenges, and these things should also be, be, be flagged up with like content designers as well. Now on the other part, I mean, it's also about being involved in standards and processes. So for example, the localization team can actually play a really instrumental role in looking at the design system when it's being created, not just content designers. So at one of my previous companies, there was this like card component, which has like images on the right part of the component, which take up space that can be used for the text. And then this led to all the localized um, translations, especially in Thai and Vietnamese, to go to four and four and five lines. I mean, things like this can be spotted by the localization team so we can fix these things. And also when it comes to things like, like um, creating like research processes, right? Localization should also be made aware of this so that they can step in to also like include, to change these processes so that they can also include like um, local participant pools in their own countries. So, I mean, this is also what, well, one of the things that happened at Grab in which, we had like look, we had like participant pools in the main office in Singapore, but then we also had regional office offices as well. And then there, there were a lot of like untapped um local people we, we could actually ask for to do research, which were underutilized. And so the localization team actually made that happen. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. I thought we would have time for more questions, but we, we are almost at time. I want to keep going. Um, I think we might need a follow up because this is just too good. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, folks, I'm so sorry. We we really are at time. Um, so we'll we'll definitely have to schedule some more time and get some other questions answered. Um and I really just appreciate Gabrielle, Rosa, and Patricia for sharing your perspective. Um, it was really great to hear from you. And if you want to learn more from Patricia and her course, um, I have to plug that uh, we'll, we'll give you 15% off with code PLUX15 so you can kind of keep the learning going. Um, but obviously, the conversation doesn't stop here. Um, and so would love to kind of keep in touch with everyone. Um, and you can find myself and all of us on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, I think this has been a great Kind of conversation to hear from hear from everyone from different corners of the world so thank you so much for joining everyone really appreciate it thank you rosa thank you thank Patricia you so and gabriel i thank want to you. keep talking thank you thank you okay <laughs> super helpful thank you so much all right goodbye everyone we will um we'll have a follow-up soon goodbye